Section 11 For several months the old wine-grower came constantly to his wife's room at all hours of the day, without ever uttering his daughter's name, or seeing her, or making the smallest allusion to her. Madame Grandet did not leave her chamber, and daily grew worse. Nothing softened the old man. He remained unmoved, harsh, and cold as a granite rock. He continued to go and come about his business as usual, but ceased to stutter, talked less, and was more obdurate in business transactions than ever before. Often he made mistakes in adding up his figures. "'Something is going on at the Grandets,' said the Grassinists and the Cruchotines. "'What has happened in the Grandet family?' became a fixed question which everybody asked everybody else at the little evening parties of Saumur. Eugenie went to Mass escorted by Nanon. If Madame des Grassins said a few words to her on coming out of church, she answered in an evasive manner, without satisfying any curiosity. However, at the end of two months it became impossible to hide, either from the three Cruchots or from Madame des Grassins, the fact that Eugenie was in confinement. There came a moment when all pretexts failed to explain her perpetual absence. Then, though it was impossible to discover by whom the secret had been betrayed, all the town became aware that ever since New Year's Day Mademoiselle Grandet had been kept in her room, without fire, on bread and water, by her father's orders, and that Nanon cooked little dainties and took them to her secretly at night. It was even known that the young woman was not able to see or take care of her mother, except at certain times when her father was out of the house. Grandet's conduct was severely condemned. The whole town outlawed him, so to speak. They remembered his treachery, his hard-heartedness, and they excommunicated him. When he passed along the streets, people pointed him out and muttered at him. When his daughter came down the winding street, accompanied by Nanon, on her way to Mass or Vespers, the inhabitants ran to the windows and examined with intense curiosity the bearing of the rich heiress and her countenance, which bore the impress of angelic gentleness and melancholy. Her imprisonment and the condemnation of her father were as nothing to her. Had she not a map of the world, the little bench, the garden, the angle of the wall? Did she not taste upon her lips the honey that love's kisses left there? She was ignorant for a time that the town talked about her, just as Grandet himself was ignorant of it. Pious and pure in heart before God, her conscience and her love helped her to suffer patiently the wrath and vengeance of her father. One deep grief silenced all others. Her mother, that gentle, tender creature, made beautiful by the light which shone from the inner to the outer as she approached the tomb, her mother was perishing from day to day. Eugenie often reproached herself as the innocent cause of the slow, cruel malady that was wasting her away. This remorse, though her mother soothed it, bound her still closer to her love. Every morning, as soon as her father left the house, she went to the bedside of her mother, and there Nanon brought her breakfast. The poor girl, sad and suffering through the sufferings of her mother, would turn her face to the old servant with a mute gesture, weeping, and yet not daring to speak of her cousin. It was Madame Grandet who first found courage to say, "'Where is he? Why does he not write?' Let us think about him, mother, but not speak of him. You are ill, you before all. All meant him. My child, said Madame Grandet, I do not wish to live. God protects me and enables me to look with joy to the end of my misery. Every utterance of this woman was unfalteringly pious and Christian. Sometimes during the first months of the year, when her husband came to breakfast with her and tramped up and down the room, she would say to him a few religious words, always spoken with angelic sweetness, yet with the firmness of a woman to whom approaching death lends a courage she had lacked in life. "'Monsieur, I thank you for the interest you take in my health,' she would answer when he made some commonplace inquiry. But if you really desire to render my last moments less bitter and to ease my grief, take back your daughter. Be a Christian, a husband, and a father. 
when he heard these words grandet would sit down by the bed with the air of a man who sees the rain coming and quietly gets under the shelter of a gateway till it is over when these touching tender and religious supplications had all been made he would say you are rather pale to-day my poor wife absolute forgetfulness of his daughter seemed graven on his stony brow on his closed lips he was unmoved by the tears which flowed down the white cheeks of his unhappy wife as she listened to his meaningless answers may god pardon you she said even as i pardon you you will some day stand in need of mercy since madame grandet's illness he had not dared to make use of his terrible ta 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 yet for all that his despotic nature was not disarmed by this angel of gentleness whose ugliness day by day decreased driven out by the ineffable expression of moral qualities which shone upon her face she was all soul the spirit of prayer seemed to purify her and refine those homely features and make them luminous who has not seen the phenomenon of a like transfiguration on sacred faces where the habits of the soul have triumphed over the plainest features giving them that spiritual illumination whose light comes from the purity and nobility of the inward thought the spectacle of this transformation wrought by the struggle which consumed the last shreds of the human life of this woman did somewhat affect the old cooper though feebly for his nature was of iron if his language ceased to be contemptuous an imperturbable silence which saved his dignity as master of the household took its place and ruled his conduct when the faithful nanon appeared in the market many quips and quirks and complaints about the master whistled in her ears but however loudly public opinion condemned m grandet the old servant defended him for the honor of the family well she would say to his detractors don't we all get hard as we get old why shouldn't he get horny too stop telling lies mademoiselle lives like a queen she's alone that's true but she likes it besides my masters have good reasons at last towards the end of spring madame grandet worn out by grief even more than by illness having failed in spite of her prayers to reconcile the father and daughter confided her secret troubles to the cruchots keep a girl of twenty-three on bread and water cried m de bonfons without any reason too why that constitutes wrongful cruelty she can contest as much in as upon come nephew spare us your legal jargon said the notary set your mind at ease madame i will put a stop to such treatment to-morrow eugenie hearing herself mentioned came out of her room gentlemen she said coming forward with a proud step i beg you not to interfere in this matter my father is master in his own house as long as i live under his roof i am bound to obey him his conduct is not subject to the approbation or the disapprobation of the world he is accountable to god only i appeal to your friendship to keep total silence in this affair to blame my father is to attack our family honor i am much obliged to you for the interest you have shown in me you will do me an additional service if you will put a stop to the offensive rumors which are current in the town of which i am accidentally informed she is right said madame grandet mademoiselle the best way to stop such rumors is to procure your liberty answered the old notary respectfully struck with the beauty which seclusion melancholy and love had stamped upon her face well my daughter let m cruchot manage the matter if he is so sure of success he understands your father and how to manage him if you wish to see me happy for my few remaining days you must at any cost be reconciled to your father on the morrow grandet in pursuance of a custom he had begun since eugenie's imprisonment took a certain number of turns up and down the little garden he had chosen the hour when eugenie brushed and arranged her hair when the old man reached the walnut tree he hid behind its trunk and remained for a few moments watching his daughter's movements hesitating perhaps between the course to which the obstinacy of his character impelled him 
and his natural desire to embrace his child sometimes he sat down on the rotten old bench where charles and eugenie had vowed eternal love and then she too looked at her father secretly in the mirror before which she stood if he rose and continued his walk she sat down obligingly at the window and looked at the angle of the wall where the pale flowers hung where the venus hair grew from the crevices with the bindweed and the sedum a white or yellow stone crop very abundant in the vineyards of saumur and at tours maitre cruchot came early and found the old wine-grower sitting in the fine june weather on the little bench his back against the division wall of the garden engaged in watching his daughter what may you want maitre cruchot he said perceiving the notary i came to speak to you on business aha have you brought some gold in exchange for my silver no no i have not come about money it is about your daughter eugenie all the town is talking of her and you what does the town meddle for a man's house is his castle very true and a man may kill himself if he likes or what is worse he may fling his money into the gutter what do you mean why your wife is very ill my friend you ought to consult monsieur bergerin she is likely to die if she does die without receiving proper care you will not be very easy in mind i take it ta 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 you know a deal about my wife these doctors if once they get their foot in your house will come five and six times a day of course you will do as you think best we are old friends there is no one in all saumur who takes more interest than i in what concerns you therefore i was bound to tell you this however happen what may you have the right to do as you please you can choose your own course besides that is not what brings me here there is another thing which may have serious results for you after all you can't wish to kill your wife her life is too important to you think of your situation in connection with your daughter if madame grandet dies you must render an account to eugenie because you enjoy your wife's estate only during her lifetime at her death your daughter can claim a division of property and she may force you to sell foifon in short she is her mother's heir and you are not these words fell like a thunderbolt on the old man who was not as wise about law as he was about business he had never thought of a legal division of the estate therefore i advise you to treat her kindly added cruchot in conclusion but do you know what she has done cruchot what asked the notary curious to hear the truth and find out the cause of the quarrel she has given away her gold well wasn't it hers said the notary they all tell me that exclaimed the old man letting his arms fall to his sides with a movement that was truly tragic are you going for a mere nothing resumed cruchot to put obstacles in the way of the concessions which you will be obliged to ask from your daughter as soon as her mother dies do you call six thousand francs a mere nothing hey my old friend do you know what the inventory of your wife's property will cost if eugenie demands the division how much two three four thousand francs perhaps the property would have to be put up at auction and sold to get at its actual value instead of that if you are on good terms with by the shears of my father cried grandet turning pale as he suddenly sat down we will see about it cruchot after a moment's silence full of anguish perhaps the old man looked at the notary and said life is very hard it has many griefs cruchot he continued solemnly you would not deceive me swear to me upon your honor that all you've told me is legally true show me the law i must see the law my poor friend said the notary don't i know my own business then it is true i am robbed betrayed killed destroyed by my own daughter it is true that your daughter is her mother's heir why do we have children ah my wife i love her luckily she's sound and healthy she's a bertelliere 
she has not a month to live grandet struck his forehead went a few steps came back cast a dreadful look on cruchot and said what can be done eugenie can relinquish her claim to her mother's property should she do this you would not disinherit her i presume but if you want to come to such a settlement you must not treat her harshly what i am telling you old man is against my own interests what do i live by if it isn't liquidations inventories conveyances divisions of property we'll see we'll see don't let's talk any more about it cruchot it wrings my vitals have you received any gold no but i have a few old louis a dozen or so which you may have my good friend make it up with eugenie don't you know all saumur is pelting you with stones the scoundrels come the funds are at ninety-nine do be satisfied for once in your life at ninety-nine are they cruchot yes hey hey ninety-nine repeated the old man accompanying the notary to the street door then too agitated by what he had just heard to stay in the house he went up to his wife's room and said come mother you may have your daughter to spend the day with you i'm going to froidfond enjoy yourselves both of you this is our wedding day wife see here are sixty francs for your altar at the fete dieu you've wanted one for a long time come cheer up enjoy yourself and get well hurrah for happiness he threw ten silver pieces of six francs each upon the bed and took his wife's head between his hands and kissed her forehead my good wife you are getting well are not you how can you think of receiving the god of mercy in your house when you refuse to forgive your daughter she said with emotion ta 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 said grandet in a coaxing voice we'll see about that merciful heaven eugenie cried the mother flushing with joy come and kiss your father he forgives you but the old man had disappeared he was going as fast as his legs could carry him towards his vineyards trying to get his confused ideas into order grandet had entered his seventy-sixth year during the last two years his avarice had increased upon him as all the persistent passions of men increase at a certain age as if to illustrate an observation which applies equally to misers ambitious men and others whose lives are controlled by any dominant idea his affections had fastened upon one special symbol of his passion the sight of gold the possession of gold had become a monomania his despotic spirit had grown in proportion to his avarice and to part with the control of the smallest fraction of his property at the death of his wife seemed to him a thing against nature to declare his fortune to his daughter to give an inventory of his property landed and personal for the purposes of division why he cried aloud in the midst of a field where he was pretending to examine a vine it would be cutting my throat he came at last to a decision and returned to saumur in time for dinner resolved to unbend to eugenie and pet and coax her that he might die regally holding the reins of his millions in his own hands so long as the breath was in his body at the moment when the old man who chanced to have his pass-key in his pocket opened the door and climbed with a stealthy step up the stairway to go into his wife's room eugenie had brought the beautiful dressing-case from the oak cabinet and placed it on her mother's bed mother and daughter in grandet's absence allowed themselves the pleasure of looking for a likeness to charles in the portrait of his mother it is exactly his forehead and his mouth eugenie was saying as the old man opened the door at the look which her husband cast upon the gold madame grandet cried out oh god have pity upon us the old man sprang upon the box as a famished tiger might spring upon a sleeping child what's this he said snatching the treasure and carrying it to the window gold good gold he cried all gold it weighs two pounds aha charles gave you that for your money did he eh why didn't you tell me so it was a good bargain little one 
yes you are my daughter i see that eugenie trembled in every limb this came from charles of course didn't it continued the old man yes father it is not mine it is a sacred trust ta 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 he took your fortune and now you can get it back father grandet took his knife to pry out some of the gold to do this he placed the dressing-case on a chair eugenie sprang forward to recover it but her father who had his eye on her and on the treasure too pushed her back so violently with a thrust of his arm that she fell upon her mother's bed monsieur monsieur cried the mother lifting herself up grandet had opened his knife and was about to apply it to the gold father cried eugenie falling on her knees and dragging herself close to him with clasped hands father in the name of all the saints and the virgin in the name of christ who died upon the cross in the name of your eternal salvation father for my life's sake father do not touch that it is neither yours nor mine it is a trust placed in my hands by an unhappy relation i must give it back to him uninjured if it is a trust why were you looking at it to look at it is as bad as touching it father don't destroy it or you will disgrace me father do you hear oh have pity said the mother father cried eugenie in so startling a voice that nanon ran upstairs terrified eugenie sprang upon a knife that was close at hand well what now said grandet coldly with a callous smile oh you are killing me said the mother father if your knife so much as cuts a fragment of that gold i will stab myself with this one you have already driven my mother to her death you will now kill your child do as you choose wound for wound grandet held his knife over the dressing-case and hesitated as he looked at his daughter are you capable of doing it eugenie he said yes yes said the mother she'll do it if she says so cried nanon be reasonable monsieur for once in your life the old man looked at the gold and then at his daughter alternately for an instant madame grandet fainted there don't you see monsieur that madame is dying cried nanon come come my daughter we won't quarrel for a box here take it he cried hastily flinging the case upon the bed nanon go and fetch monsieur bergerin come mother said he kissing his wife's hand it's all over there we've made up haven't we little one no more dry bread you shall have all you want ah she opens her eyes well mother little mother come see i'm kissing eugenie she loves her cousin and she may marry him if she wants to she may keep his case but don't die mother live a long time yet my poor wife come try to move listen you shall have the finest altar that ever was made in saumur oh how can you treat your wife and daughter so said madame grandet in a feeble voice i won't do so again never again cried her husband you shall see my poor wife he went to his inner room and returned with a handful of louis which he scattered on the bed here eugenie see wife all these are for you he said fingering the coins come be happy wife feel better get well you shan't want for anything nor eugenie either here's a hundred louis d'or for her you won't give these away will you eugenie hein eh? madame grandet and her daughter looked at each other in astonishment take back your money father we ask for nothing but your affection well well that's right he said pocketing the coins let's be good friends we will all go down to dinner to-day and we'll play loto every evening for two sous you shall both be happy hey wife alas i wish i could if it would give you pleasure said the dying woman but i cannot rise from my bed poor mother said grandet you don't know how i love you and you too my daughter he took her in his arms and kissed her oh how good it is to kiss a daughter when we have been angry with her there mother don't you see it's all over now go and put that away eugenie he added pointing to the case go don't be afraid i shall never speak of it again never 
m bergerin the celebrated doctor of saumur presently arrived after an examination he told grandet positively that his wife was very ill but that perfect peace of mind a generous diet and great care might prolong her life until the autumn will all that cost much said the old man will she need medicines not much medicine but a great deal of care answered the doctor who could scarcely restrain a smile now monsieur bergerin said grandet you are a man of honour are not you i trust to you come and see my wife how and when you think necessary save my good wife i love her don't you see though i never talk about it i keep things to myself i'm full of trouble troubles began when my brother died i have to spend enormous sums on his affairs in paris why i'm paying through my nose there's no end to it adieu monsieur if you can save my wife save her i'll spare no expense not even if it costs me a hundred or two hundred francs in spite of grandet's fervent wishes for the health of his wife whose death threatened more than death to him in spite of the consideration he now showed on all occasions for the least wish of his astonished wife and daughter in spite of the tender care which eugenie lavished upon her mother madame grandet rapidly approached her end every day she grew weaker and wasted visibly as women of her age when attacked by serious illness are wont to do she was fragile as the foliage in autumn the radiance of heaven shone through her as the sun strikes athwart the withering leaves and gilds them it was a death worthy of her life a christian death and is not that sublime in the month of october eighteen twenty two her virtues her angelic patience her love for her daughter seemed to find special expression and then she passed away without a murmur lamb without spot she went to heaven regretting only the sweet companion of her cold and dreary life for whom her last glance seemed to prophesy a destiny of sorrows she shrank from leaving her ewe lamb white as herself alone in the midst of a selfish world that sought to strip her of her fleece and grasp her treasures my child she said as she expired there is no happiness except in heaven you will know it some day <laughs>